Good afternoon or good morning from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune Isham and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series that's held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center, otherwise known as NCCWSC. They're located in Reston, Virginia. The NCCWSC's Climate Change Science and Management webinar series uh, highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation, and it aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and on wildlife. Now I'd like to introduce uh, a senior scientist at the uh, NCCWSC, and that's Dr. Sean Carter. Sean, welcome. Thanks, Ashley. And thank you to everyone joining us today. It's my privilege to introduce a couple of our, uh, my esteemed colleagues here at uh, NICWISC. Um, Robin O'Malley is our policy and partnership coordinator here at our center, and he, uh, which manages the Department of Interior Climate Science Centers. Uh, prior to joining our team here, Robin was the director of program development and environmental reporting at the Heinz Center. Uh, he's also worked at the Department of Interior at different levels, um, both on policy staff and also chief of staff when the National Biological Survey was around, uh, also as special assistant to Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt. He's also been deputy science advisor within Interior, associate director of natural resources at the White House CEQ, and has also been senior environmental advisor to uh, Governor Thomas Keene of uh, New Jersey. He holds a master's from Harvard's uh, Kennedy School of Government and a bachelor's from um, SUNY New York. And also with us today is Laura Thompson. Uh, she's a biologist here at our center, and her work includes gathering information on climate change vulnerability assessments for natural systems and understand progress towards climate adaptation change adaptation planning, and her research interests are to help understand impacts of climate variables on genetic variation of wild populations and the potential to adapt evolutionarily to future climate change. And Laura just recently finished her PhD at Trent University uh, in Petersburg, Ontario, and that was focusing on landscape and climate uh, factors contributing to genetic structure of woodland caribou. She also holds a BS and MS uh, from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and wildlife. And we're going to be starting today with Laura, so it's my uh, privilege to introduce Laura, and you have it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everyone, for joining. So I'm going to start out uh, this presentation by giving you uh, a little bit of an overview of what to expect uh, during the next hour. First, we're going to uh, provide a, a brief introduction on vulnerability assessments and, and why they are important and then provide uh, an understanding on the, uh, the need for this particular tool, tool that we call CRAVE, and then provide an overview of the CRAVE features and how you can help you and your partners, and then end up with some, some highlights on CRAVE. So to start, to give you a little bit of background on vulnerability assessments, so um, there's a number of resources that are, are of particular interest to, uh, to many of us, and whether it be uh, fish and wildlife species or habitats, ecosystems, or for some may be more interested in infrastructure or uh, crop uh, resources or cultural resources. However, climate change has the potential to um, affect those different resources in a variety of of ways. So it's important to assess vulnerability, which is defined as the likelihood that a particular resource of interest will have, have adverse effects to particular climate changes, whether it be changes of precipitation or temperature. And so this graph shows, uh, this was actually taken from uh, the National Wildlife Federation's publication, Scanning the Conservation Horizon, that explains the components of, of vulnerability and how to go about assessing vulnerability. And this is also a similar framework that was provided in the uh, 2007 IPCC report. And so some of the key components are exposure, which is the likelihood that, uh, or the potential climate changes that a particular resource of interest might be exposed to, whether it be changes in temperature or even associated climate changes, uh, such as altered fire regimes. 
And then also sensitivity, which is the, how a particular climate change is might affect your particular resource of interest. And then those two components can be assessed to understand the overall impacts of, of climate change on your resource. But it's also important to assess whether your resource might be able to ameliorate those impacts through adaptive capacity. And, and by following those steps, you can get an understanding of, of vulnerability. So vulnerability assessments are really important for prioritizing resources of concern uh, as a result of climate change. But they also help us uh, to under, understand why particular resources might be vulnerable, which is really important in adaptation planning. And so this framework, also taken from scanning the conservation horizon, shows how vulnerability assessments fit into the adaptation planning framework. And so um, in the upper left-hand corner, you, um, you, you start with the framework by identifying your conservation targets, whether it be a species, ecosystem, or some type of infrastructure resource. And then you assess vulnerability to climate change by assessing sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity. And then you can identify management options to reduce sensitivity exposure and increase adaptive capacity, and then implement those management options on the ground through changes in policy, practice, or institutional changes. And so a more recent publication, also by the National Wildlife Federation, went into more detail about the adaptation process. And I, I just put this in because it shows multiple steps of, in, in adaptation planning. And, and, uh, but I wanted to point out that uh, one of the first uh, and critical steps is assessing vulnerability to climate change. And, and, and it's really an important step for um, identifying meaningful adaptation strategies. However, there's a lot of issues um, for it is somewhat of a daunting task for many resource managers just being able to collect the necessary information and um, using the relevant science that uh, may be needed. And so um, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Robin, who will um, describe some of the uh, issues that uh, came about because of, of, some of developing this tool. Hey, thank you. Um, and again, thanks everybody for being on the phone. Um, so as people, as we've been uh, moving along through the past few years, um, these are the kinds of questions that we get um, it, from folks who are faced with the challenge of adapting or planning for adaptation to climate change. And you know, what are the impacts? Um, how do I do this? Uh, where do I get the data? Those kinds of questions. Uh, and so that's some of the, the, the uh, the motivation for what we've been thinking about and what we're going to talk to you about. Um, and we uh, have worried about some things uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the thousand flowers blooming strategy, which is good for uh, uh, coming up with interesting ideas. But um, we can almost guarantee that uh, certainly within the federal government and probably within any other large uh, body of folks uh, that we're, we're duplicating some work or we're duplicating similar work, um, being redundant, and we simply don't have enough money to be able to afford that. Maybe more importantly, we're all at the forefront of a really new and evolving area of science and conservation practice, and we have to have mechanisms to learn for each, from each other. Um, we've got to be able to move the information around quickly. We've got to be able to uh, learn lessons from other similar studies about similar resources. We've got to aggregate over broader areas. We've got to learn about uh, different methods of doing things. And so um, the notion that we needed a place to look for information about um, methods and outcomes and resources for vulnerability assessment uh, became clear over the past few years. So uh, that's what drove us to where we are now. Um, and this is the simple goal of the CRAVE project. Um, and I want to unpack this statement a little bit uh, to give you a sense of uh, a little bit more granularity for what we're talking about. Um, this is a project that provides uh, descriptions and contact information. It's not a full database of all the monitoring data and the 
uh, the uh, graphic material and maps, et cetera, it's really uh, a, a phone book, a metadata record, essentially, for uh, vulnerability assessments. Um, it's about studies that attempt to answer the question, what is the impact of climate change on X? Um, it's not a, a, a database of downscaling methods or a database of monitoring data sets. Um, even though those may be really important components and are often really important components of, of vulnerability assessments. This is about things that draw on that kind of information and uh, move it towards answering a question about impacts. And resources of interest, um, our organization, the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center and uh, eight climate science centers, focus essentially on natural and cultural resources. Um, there's some spillover and overlap with uh, the built environment and maybe less, although a growing amount, with social and economic and health kinds of uh, studies. We've designed this, and you'll see some examples where uh, other communities that are knowledgeable about some of these endpoints um, have helped us build the capacity to incorporate uh, vulnerability assessments of those kinds of endpoints into this. So. Um, it's essentially, uh, and I'll make this point later, a community uh, effort. And uh, if, there's, if it's not uh, capable of handling uh, studies about the points of interest uh, you have, then uh, we should talk. So I said it's a, it's a registry. These are not uh, deep files of lots of data and, uh, and, and graphs, et cetera. And uh, we've divided it into some pretty basic core project information and then some additional details. And I'll uh, say a little bit more. There's even a smaller list of things that you have to fill out for a basic registry entry. Um, but you see, you know, where is it? Who's doing it? Uh, I'll say more about the target and cost and status. Um, how do I get in touch? What scale is it at? Why is it being done? These kinds of things. So we have worked with a number of partners, uh, partner organizations, both who are doing studies and who are uh, interested in studying the outcome of this process uh, to identify these uh, kind of minimum components that allow you to find the kinds of work you want to find. So the fewest items that you have to put in uh, is this list. In, uh, we, our philosophy is we'd rather have more entries um, with less information, but enough basic information for people to find their way around, rather than requiring uh, an answer to every one of the questions. So um, we've managed to narrow it down to uh, where is it, who's doing it, what's the target, um, how big is this project, some sense of scale, um, and how do I get in touch with the folks. So this is the, uh, the bare minimum for uh, an element. And if that's all you have, it's worth putting the entry in uh, to allow people to track, follow that down. So I want to talk a little bit about the types of assessment targets. And this is both uh, a sense of what we've uh, captured as, as the kinds of targets we think are uh, relevant, and a little bit about how we've tried to make it easy for people to do the entry uh, and, and capture the right kind of information. So, these are the, uh, the types of, of assessment targets that it's currently possible to easily enter into the system. Um, and I'm going to go through and give you some examples of sort of where the data comes from and, and how it's linked and, again, a little bit about how you manage the system. So for individual species, we're tied into the federal uh, integrated taxonomic information system. So if you start to type a species name in the box, um, it will fill out with species that are uh, live directly from the IDIS system. Uh, so that's a, that, that is the federal standard uh, for taxonomic names, and so we, we figured we'd just draw directly from that. Um, but there's also studies that do, uh, that focus on larger numbers of species, and you probably didn't want to um, add the individual species names for all the salamanders and newts in individually. So, we put together a list of species groups at a larger level, and this is obviously the beginning of the list, but this is a drop-down list that you can pick from um, that enables you to say, okay, we're going to do all the water birds or what have you and, and pick uh, from that kind of a, uh, a drop-down list. Um, so you can capture larger groups and as, as uh, both plants and animals on this list. 
For habitat types, again, we provided a list. Um, there's always an other option that you can fill in, um, but we've provided a moderately detailed list. There's obviously a much more finely divided lists of, of ecosystem or habitat types, uh, but we, we've gotten one that's uh, got a moderate level, and this, again, is a screenshot of the first part of it, but it scrolls down uh, past the M's for a, a few, more different, uh, few more different types. And the last one I'll show an example of um, is a case where uh, we worked with a partner to develop the taxonomy here. This is a National Park Service taxonomy, and um, we at USGS are not the, uh, the cultural resource experts, uh, but we were uh, happy to work with the Park Service to find a, a taxonomy of types of uh, cultural resources um, that were the, the standards uh, around which the community could, you know, would, people would understand those. And, uh, we did the same with the built environments. I don't have a slide here, but we worked with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Bureau of Reclamation uh, to capture the kinds of uh, a built environment categories that would be relevant and understandable to folks working in those, uh, in those arenas. And uh, just the, the other uh, category that I want to highlight right now is the sort of project status and time frame. And uh, we we were encouraged to do this, and this was the benefit of working with a fairly large group of advisors. Um, we were particularly encouraged by some folks uh, outside the federal circle who uh, may not have the kind of budgets that federal agencies often have and wanted to be able to find the ones that were a little bit more within their reach. And so um, we provide some information on what does this project cost, how long did it take, um, is it done or not? Uh, and so. Uh, we're, we're just trying to, uh, again, enable people to find the kinds of studies that are relevant for their uses. So I really want to make a point about this project that this is not a, a done and ready to use, uh, or, or, you know, nobody needs to use it, just sign on and begin to work with it. This is a partnership that we need to build and a community resource we need to build. Um, and I'm going to go through some of the tasks that are relevant for this and kind of show who's had their hand in the uh, process so far and uh, where you all fit in. So we at NICWISC and the USGS Fort Collins Center um, have done the coding and design work. Um, mostly uh, the funding has come from USGS uh, with contributions from both the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service, and we're certainly open to additional ones. Um, the ideas and the design for this were really shaped by uh, this arose out of the Interagency Land Management Adaptation Group, um, which has both federal agencies and folks from outside the federal circle. Um, and we uh, created a steering committee with folks from that. Uh, we've had input from people on the USGCRP Adaptation Science Working Group. So a pretty broad uh, set of both uh, management practitioners and uh, science uh, practitioners uh, given us some sense about what we needed to cover. Um, quality assurance is a, is a legal mandate for federal agencies, um, and so any entry that is attributed to uh, being managed by a federal agency will be reviewed by someone who's designated by that agency to uh, make sure that the information is appropriate to be published about them and about a project that they are ostensibly funding. Um, we're partnering with EcoAdapt to provide a similar level, although uh, obviously some slightly different criteria for non-federal uh, vulnerability assessments, uh, that we make sure that it's a real project, that it's reasonably informative, um, that we're not getting spammed and those kinds of things. Uh, so again, a partnership uh, between USGS and a number of federal agencies and the non-governmental uh, sector. Um, we're going to maintain this infrastructure over time and, and think about designing it. We've already got a, uh, a short list of things uh, since we did the release a few weeks ago of changes we'll want to make to the, um, uh, to the basic uh, coding and, and choices and things like that. Um, and again, I uh, encourage people to think about uh, helping us out on that. Um, most importantly, though, is that we've entered into the registry uh, vulnerability assessments that have been funded by uh, the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. We're moving to uh, add uh, content for all of the vulnerability assessments conducted by USGS. 
Um, we can't enter vulnerability assessments done by your organization unless you unless we know about them and you know most about them. So everyone on this call and your partners, collaborators, and staff know about where these vulnerability assessments are. Um, and as I hope to, uh, you started to see and you'll see some more, um, we've made it as easy as possible to make an entry into this registry. Um, and so we encourage you to uh, take the time to do that, uh, again, knowing that there's some quality assurance that gets done on the back end. Another feature of the system is that um, we're working with EcoAdapt both on the QA that I mentioned, but also uh, where we started was that they uh, published the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange, which uh, has a different audience, reaches a different set of folks than uh, a federal government website would. And so uh, the, the information will be mirrored on the uh, EcoAdapt and USGS sites so that you'll be able to find it either way and we'll reach some different audiences that way. Um, we'll also be uh, linking up, uh, not, clearly exa not clear exactly how, but linking up uh, with the US, uh, the Federal Climate Resilience Toolkit, which again will reach a different kind of audience um, and bring different people to the table. So what I want to do now is go through some of the features both of the Crave system as a user, if you will, a searcher uh, who wants to find information, and then a little bit more about a couple more examples about what it's like to enter a, a, a registry entry uh, onto the uh, system. So uh, first thing, this is kind of a landing page. Um, and uh, on this page and on some subsequent pages, uh, a basic search bar uh, with uh, full text entry, a state or large marine ecosystem, managing entity, et cetera, the basic kinds of things. You know, I want to find out all of the vulnerability assessments in Colorado. You, know, you can go straight there and, and enter that. Um, but let me give you a little bit of an example. So I entered uh, trout in the full, in the, uh, full text search. And, uh, a couple things to note is that as soon as you enter something and get some results back, um, you get a, uh, a, a choice of filters. And right now, there's only five results, and so uh, it's, it's not really a problem to filter. But when we get a lot of content and you get 300 results back, you may want to filter it by some uh, finer criteria. So uh, we've built in some, uh, some filters that enable you to find a little bit more about what you want. Um, and each one of these entries that you see two of, um, you'll see has a little bit of information, a couple bits of data, um, and each one of these titles is a clickable uh, link. And if you click that link, you get a full registry entry. Um, and each one of these uh, uh, points on, on this list these are the things that we ask information about uh, for the registry. So a full registry entry would have a, a response to every one of these. And you'll see in several cases there's a not supplied, um, and that's, again, perfectly all right. Uh, anything past the minimum is, uh, is good, uh, but it, again, at least there's a few minimums. Um, and you'll see that in addition to this being a, a trout-oriented project, um, it's also got uh, focus on freshwater streams. Um, there's an opportunity to provide a web link uh, for a project. So if you have, if the project has its own website or a, a, a page on your website that provides information about it, uh, you can make that link. Again, giving people the window to find what they want. Uh, because entries are coming from uh, lots of different folks. Uh, and we're concerned about people getting spammed. Uh, we don't actually publish the, uh, the email address of the, of the contact person. Um, but in this case, if you click on uh, Jason Dunham's name here, it'll open up an email browser, uh, an email window, and uh, you can send him an email. Um, he'll get your uh, email address and can respond, uh, but we haven't published his uh, uh, information there. Um, and finally, there's an opportunity for a, a, a full abstract summary kind of document that uh, can give a pretty full description of what the, um, uh, what the study's about. So again, full range of questions. 
Um, but this is the full, uh, the full uh, set of information about any particular vulnerability assessment. You can go further than this either through the contact or through the URL or reading the summary. Um, but again, this is a metadata registry, not a, uh, a data set uh, kind of system. Now, if you log on and wish to enter a vulnerability assessment, so here I've uh, created a, an account with my Gmail uh, address, um, you'll get into a page that looks like this. Again, you still have the search access, um, but it'll allow you to add a vulnerability assessment. And uh, once you have assessments, so you can save them in draft or submit them, uh, you can go back and manage them, see where they are. Um, so if you click on the Add New Vulnerability Assessment, um, you start to get in, and I'll just step back, you get into the uh, the full questionnaire, and it's a it's a sort of two-page questionnaire, again, that, uh, that goes back and asks you something about each one of these data elements. Um, and in, in as many cases as we could, we made that as quick and painless and consistent as possible. So um, in the list of states for, well, in most cases, um, if you start to type something, um, it will pick up the items that are that have that string of characters in it. So I started typing ALA and I got Alabama, Alaska, and the Republic of Palau. This happens to be the state list. Um, we put the territories in with the states. Uh, so uh, again, making it as easy as possible. In many cases, we have drop-down lists. So for large marine ecosystems, we have a pretty pure drop-down list. Um, and if your item isn't in, the, in any of the drop-down lists, we, uh, in almost all cases, have an other information box that you can add some additional information in. So um, we've provided consistent, enabled consistency and ease of entry, but we've also added flexibility if what we have doesn't fit what you uh, need. Um, again, another example of where we've tried to provide as much uh, facility in entering, and again, for consistency, so there's a question about managing entity, who actually does this project. Um, there's a selection for tribal, federal, state, NGO, academic institution, et cetera. In this case, I picked the tribal one, and immediately below it uh, a, uh, appeared a drop-down box that has the entire list of federally recognized tribes. Um, so you can go down and uh, uh, select uh, one or more tribes, uh, I guess for managing entities, like one tribe that's uh, conducting the, the project. But for example, if you're working with a, uh, a tribe that's a state-recognized tribe or a self-recognized tribe, um, you can always um, add in an other. And so we haven't limited you to the uh, selections that we've got. I want to call attention to, again, both the other, which I've mentioned, and the not sure or uh, we provided a lot of these uh, opt-outs so that you can get through the questionnaire and not answer. Um, and again, we would rather have an entry that gives the basic information and uh, where to go for more information than uh, have people forced or uh, forced to answer uh, things they might not have information about or uh, not able to provide the entry. So um, that's the basic outline. Uh, again, a metadata registry that uh, we need to build together uh, to help and enable the learning that we need to do across the community as we uh, figure out how to assess vulnerability and figure out how to link that information to adaptation actions. So I encourage you to go to take a, to go to take a look at it, and I'm happy to open the floor for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Laura. So our first question comes in uh, through the chat box, and it's from Sarah, and it says, vulnerability assessments that were collaborative among numerous federal agencies and NGOs, how would those be reviewed for quality? And we have a second part of that question afterwards. Um, yeah, we, we are thinking very hard about how to um, make sure uh, well, that's, you're, you're raising an interesting aspect, but we know there will be um, uh, projects that are funded by and, and uh, supported by and conducted by multiple agencies. And uh, we have a challenge in making sure we don't have duplicate entries, uh, and we have the challenge that you mentioned. I would say that 
the primary federal agency, the lead federal agency, uh, maybe in this case the one that has the most dollars in the uh, pot, would be the one that would be selected as the lead agency, uh, the implementing agency. Um, we have options for uh, uh, the managing entity and partners, and we'd certainly encourage all of those um, uh, agencies to be listed as partners, but uh, at this point we need to pick a, a primary agency. Also another question coming in, and it says, does the USGS version work better with Internet Explorer or Google Chrome or in some other browser? We think that the, uh, it will work best in Chrome or Firefox and uh, higher versions of Internet Explorer. Excellent, thank you. Um, also, are you looking for assessments of a broad range of climate change impacts or also assessments of specific impacts such as sea level rise? Uh, I think we're looking for both of those. Uh, if by broad range you mean multiple kinds of impacts, uh, sea level rise and heat and other things together, uh, yes, and then very targeted ones, uh, e either way. I mean, I, I think either of those are likely to be of interest to other people in the community. Thank you. Um, another question. They were just searching it on the Internet. Um, and when they went to search for tribal agencies, only one popped up. Is that correct? I'm not sure. Well, uh, I'm not sure where their search uh, was. There may only be a few uh, vulnerability assessments that deal with tribal agencies that have been listed so far. Um, and uh, until uh, uh, so some of the some of the lists are only populated with things that have actually been entered. Um, the list I showed uh, is uh, should come up uh, if you want to enter a new one. Um, but if you're searching for existing vulnerability assessments, um, the list that will that will uh, show up to you uh, only includes those items for which there already is an assessment. So there may only be uh, that one that's uh, that's been registered so far. Okay, thank you. And then, if Robin or Laura, if you guys have questions from your group, please feel free to chime in. Uh, we're good here. Okay. We have some more coming in through the chat. Um, this one says, may have missed this in the presentation, but can you um, insert a link to the vulnerability assessments if they are on a publicly accessible site versus obtaining, a, versus obtaining through a lead agency? So that's just the Crave website, right, Robin? Uh, yes, although um, I, I think I, I can also interpret the question: if someone knows about a vulnerability assessment that's posted on a on an accessible website, they could enter that. Um, they'll have to pick at some point um, who did that study, and so that again will uh, they'll have to be somebody, some entity identified as a managing entity for it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I think you started touching on this, um, at least saying that they're interconnected, but it says, uh, how are Crave and Cake related? Um, so Cake is an existing resource that is essentially a, a, also a metadata registry of projects, publications, people, um, many different resources that are relevant to climate change adaptation. Um, EcoAdapt and the CAKE staff are now building uh, a mechanism to incorporate uh, all of the vulnerability assessments that come in through CRAVE into their system, uh, but also to enable you to search essentially as if you're searching CRAVE. So, um, on CAKE, you'll be able to get anything on CRAVE plus anything that's already on the CAKE registry. Uh, and, and so it's there, uh, uh, that's the relationship. Uh, CAKE is a, is a larger resource and we're, it will be integrated into that. Excellent, thank you. Um, one more question. And it says, is the CRAVE team going to systematically comb through 
the Climate Science Centers and the Landscape Conservation Cooperative Projects and enter vulnerability assessments into CRAVE, or should CSC and LCC staff enter their projects? Um, that's a half and half answer. We have entered all of the projects that uh, through fiscal year 14 that we're aware of that are funded that are vulnerability assessments at climate science centers. We have not done so at the LCCs. We have distributed this information to the LCC uh, through the LCC network and we hope uh, that they enter those projects. Um, we've in fact uh, had some discussions and when I mentioned there was one of the modifications um, it's not currently possible to choose an entity, uh, to choose a, a type of entity right now that is an LCC as a managing entity, um, and we realize that's, uh, uh, that's a mistake, and so we're going to work on doing that. But uh, we encourage the LCCs to enter the projects that they have as vulnerability assessments into the system. We have not done that. We've done it for the CSE side of the house. Thank you. And a somewhat related question, and it says, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has comprehensive conservation plans associated with its refuges. Some of these have, quote unquote, mini vulnerability assessments incorporated in the Pacific Northwest. Are you looking to include these types of assessments um, that are part of the broader planning effort? Um, I would say yes. And uh, I believe we had that very same discussion with Kurt Johnson, uh, who is the Fish and Wildlife Service lead reviewer. Um, and uh, he, uh, we agreed that uh, if, it answer, if it asks the question or, or tries to probe the question as what is the effect of climate change on fill in the blank, um, it fits our definition of a vulnerability assessment. We're, we, we don't think we should be really uh, rig, uh, uh, strict about the definition having to have adaptive capacity and sensitivity and those particular elements that Laura talked about, but really something that asks that question. And from what I know of those planning documents and uh, that those, those uh, again, probe that question and try to provide some, uh, some feedback for that. So I would say yes to that. Excellent. Thank you. And then just touching back on the um, LCCs, um, Tom, who had asked that question, said that he's going to bring it up with the LCC coordinators and some of the science coordinators and try to come up with a systematic approach to enter um, the ones that have been uh, completed by the LCCs as well. Yeah, thank you. I, and again, I, I would just uh, say we've tried to make it be quick and easy to do. Um, these are not, this is not a lot of uh, free writing. There's a lot of radio boxes and check boxes and selections and drop down menus that that make this an easy form to fill out and to provide an entry. Uh, and then uh, knowing that there'll be a second set of eyes to make sure they're, you know, uh, so it's, it should be relatively easy. So I appreciate uh, you taking that, uh, that uh, time. Um, and then we have another question that says, um, what about ex experimental research projects. Um, I'm sorry, it's kind of popping all over the place, excuse me. Uh, an example is um, effects of ocean acidification and plant productivity response to carbon dioxide enrichment, are they of interest? I don't see why not. Um, that fits into the category of um, what is the effect of a climate change component on a resource. Another question says, we have just started a two-year comprehensive region-wide vulnerability assessment. Should we wait until we are complete with our assessment or should we enter it now? Enter it now. Um, if you'll recall, and uh, I might be able to get back to it, but um, the, uh, the system asks whether it's planned, in progress, or completed. We will do for all of the entries that are in the system a periodic, probably annual, um, call out to everybody, email out to the contacts, saying, has, has this changed? Have you completed this or what have you? So 
Um, put it in as an in-progress project. Uh, you'll be able to say when it's expected to be completed. And then uh, at some point, we'll prompt you to go back and review the entry and turn it into a completed one. So uh, do it now. And then it just says um, one recommendation was that maybe you change your project time frame choices. Uh, the way that it is currently set up seems to leave gaps in time. Okay. Because uh, their project's about uh, two and a half years. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's one. Yep, uh, fair enough. Uh, I can't <laughs> argue with that. Uh, there may be some logic that's missing in some of those uh, some of those numbers. So, uh, uh, don't disagree. Guys. <laughs> yep. Yep. That was good. That was good. Um, and uh, so, well, as we're getting to the end, um, if you have more questions or you get in and. Uh, have questions, first of all, there's a user help that you can always call on that's in the system. Um, but please let us know. And if there are uh, things that make it hard for you to enter your project because it doesn't fit in the way we've, uh, we've done it, uh, we'd like to hear that uh, rather than going away mad, as it were. Uh, let us know that that doesn't work or it's uh, unsatisfactory the way you have to characterize it. Um, I'm actually listening to the discussions about multiple agencies and thinking about uh, how we might uh, make it clearer that, uh, I mean, we all know that in some cases there really isn't a lead agency. Everybody's got a bunch of money in the pot and it's moving forward. Um, we have, at this point, we have to pick. Um, we're going to think about how to handle that in the future. So uh, let us know. This is a community resource. Um, we got a lot of input on designing it, but as people use it, we'll certainly find out more um, interesting things that you either want to characterize your uh, project or search for things. And so uh, keep the dialogue open. Uh, contact us. There's a, a contact form on the page, a couple emails here. Uh, encourage you to go ahead and uh, test it out and see what works and doesn't work. Excellent. Thank you.